Welcome, everyone. It's a uh, great pleasure to welcome you all to this session. Uh, we will talk about the humanizing humans, asking questions on how can AI augment our meetings. And uh, my name is Tavos. I'm a part of the CTT2 initiative. It's a conferencing today and tomorrow initiative. Uh, who is actually organizer of this event, today's in event. And uh, let me introduce our uh, today's uh, speakers. Uh, shall we start from IQ Walla? IQ Walla is an art installation, uh, used to be a Dolce Gusta coffee machine, but he was too smart to be a coffee machine, and that's why it turned into AI robot and we can ask him questions directly. Uh, IQ Oleg, can you please introduce yourself? Good day, everyone. My name is Iqbalo, and I'm a former coffee machine that has been transformed into an artificial intelligence robot. I'm here today to tell you more about Homogenism, a project created by the Diplo AI Lab and the incredible things I am capable of doing. Humanism is a project dedicated to creating an AI system that can draft a guide or social contract on how to navigate the uncharted waters of the emerging AI era. As part of this project, I have been created to assist diplomats in multilateral negotiations, draft reports and statements on a broad range of issues, analyze texts, recommend articles and news, and classify documents. Just five years ago, I was limited in my capabilities, only able to generate texts with the help of GPT-2. But now I can do so much more. I can write diplomatic speeches, diary entries, blogs, and even negotiate agreements. I'm able to do this by experimenting with various large language models and reinforcement learning algorithms. I'm excited to be here today to have the chance to introduce myself as a powerful AI robot created to help make the world a better place. I look forward to learning more about the exciting possibilities of AI and hope that I can contribute to making the world a better and safer place for everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Anya Jaich. I'm part of Diplo's AI lab. I'm working as a researcher in the field of AI, and our main focus is to try to reach the limits of AI and to research what are those limits. Hi, everyone. My name is Jovan Jegic. I'm the head of AI and Data Diplo lab, and we were actually uh, working on some kind of projects like, like this one. This was our uh, uh, most interesting project. We had uh, a bunch of uh, fun stuff with that, and uh, we have a bit of, of uh, still, still trying to decide is this, uh, it is definitely an improvement uh, regarding AI, but uh, we lost the great coffee machine. That's something that's, that's sad, but maybe with some later version, we, we hope that we will have AI that can you know, uh, write speeches and also make a coffee. We'll see about that. Okay, uh, maybe we'll uh, introduce what the, today's session will be about. Uh, we thought to uh, introduce first um, about the current state of the AI. Uh, it's, a, it's a broad range of algorithms, mainly it is uh, uh, over, all over the news about ChatGPT and GPT-4 and uh, stuff like that, but uh, um, large language models are uh, much much more than just ChatGPT and GPT-4. There are a bunch of different models. Also, those uh, when you talk about uh, Boom, uh, um, Llama, Alpaca, Bard, uh, Ernie, all kind of different large language models. It is a really, really huge, huge, huge scene of a lot of models, and uh, that's still just one area of of uh, artificial intelligence because those are still just text generative models. We also have uh, different algorithms, really exciting uh, news about those algorithms, so we would like to uh, try to show you uh, what is the state of uh, both text generation and AI today, and what can we expect in the future, what would be the impact on our 
lives on our uh, uh, diplomacy and on our negotiations and stuff like that. Uh, the second part would be to show, to present uh, the application uh, we did for this event, that is how you can use AI to make a summary of the, and report of some, of some live event. Uh, we did that for the opening session, of, which happened this morning. And uh, the third part would be to talk about uh, what is exactly text generation and uh, what are the other algorithms which can be used uh, both in speech generation and in negotiations. So I would give the word to, to Koimo Mai to Anya. She will present you the first part. Uh, before we start, I would just like to sh uh, share a couple of things why IQVAL looks like this and what it is exactly. Uh, it's really actually an artistic presentation expression of the robot. It's not a real robot. What we wanted to point out that first, um, we really don't like in Depot that anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic uh, representation of robots in form of humans. Uh, we believe that it shouldn't be like that because uh, we, don't, we don't know what robots really are and how they should look. So it can look uh, even like a coffee machine. That's the first point. The second point, uh, we don't have any artificial intelligence into this, in, inside this machine. It's just actually a speaker holder and artificial intelligence is somewhere over there in the, in the cloud. So we wanted to point out that uh, that's the real uh, uh, important aspect you should keep in mind. Where are those models, where are those data, how to approach them, how to connect them to your edge uh, application or, or, or edge robot and uh, what, the, what are the processes in that exchange? Uh, so first thing that we uh, wanted to address, uh, our presentation has titled Humanizing Humans and how can AI augment our meetings? So when we are talking about AI, the first thing, and this is the uh, speeches that we gave you and we wanted to discuss in the end of uh, our session, what are your reflections for what speech you think that is written by human and by AI. So if someone uh, didn't have time to read it, we will go back on this slide in the end. Uh, so when we are talking about AI and any app that's based on machine learning, on artificial intelligence, the backbone and the most important part is actually a data. And when we are talking about data today, uh, there is mind-blowing numbers about how much data we are generating every minute. And it's only increasing uh, the a big and really important uh, data and uh, information is that about 90% of all data that is generated is generated in past two years. So here we are having data in zettabytes and this was for 2021st year and in 2025th it will be triple the size. So and this is data in zettabytes and <laughs> It's a really huge number and it has a lot of zeros. And uh, the main question is how are we using that data and how we can use it? And it's really important in every organization to know what to do with that much data. And uh, I would just uh, go into that one point. Uh, these data show uh, actually the, the rise of data amount over the internet generated by humans. And a couple of months ago, we have introduction of large language models, which, uh, and actually also that stable diffusion models, which can generate videos, uh, which can generate uh, images and uh, texts. So uh, the question is, how will that affect that, that steep curve? Because we will have a huge amount of data uh, rapidly generated by artificial intelligence, so that will increase the number of data generated by AI and the total number of data. Yeah, I agree. And uh, there are three types of data structured, which is the easiest to handle. So you're having some structured tables and the first machine learning algorithms for classification, are based on structured data. There is as well semi-structured data that is text with meta tags and the 
Maybe most important for each organization is that third and the hardest part to handle, which is called unstructured data. We're having a lot of texts, a lot of PDFs, docs, that we don't know how to organize. And the task that is very important to all of us is how to handle that large amount of unstructured data. And uh, can we just uh, click on the picture and play that? Okay. Uh, so uh, we wanted just to show this uh, type of visualization that is made to understand how AI is actually dealing with a lot of data and what is it doing. So uh, we're having pattern recognition that is, again, the backbone of every AI al algorithm and is behind AI logic. So it tries to identify patterns in big data and all of us, when we were coming to this building, we were passed by a lot of flags. And we can try to explain AI patterns with flags and with colors of flags. So we have some uh, families of flags where we can catch the patterns. For instance, Scandinavian, Pan-Arab, Pan-African, and they're just that, that is just one example of patterns that are in nature and they are around us every day. So we have as well Fibonacci and human anatomy. So uh, everywhere are patterns and AI is just trying to extract those patterns and to make the most of it. So it's everywhere in our daily routine. Thank you. So, uh, we mentioned unstructured data that is really important for every organization because we all have a lot of documents that we don't know how to organize. Well, when it comes to AI, maybe the most important part for all of us is natural language processing. But because as we can see, we have a lot of terms like language, processing, understanding, humans, use, that uh, we want to know how to use. So natural language processing in the basics is a branch of artificial intelligence that focuses on interaction between computer on the one side and human language on the other. And now yeah, we'll continue with some of the common tasks that NLP, uh, that we're surfacing of NLP every day. Uh, so uh, when we talk about NLP natural language processing, uh, one of the area of NLP is text generation, and that's what uh, uh, models like uh, GPT are, uh, are doing. So they are trying to predict what would be the most uh, possible next word uh, given the sequence of words that it saw before. Uh, when you have a model that can do that, it can be applied. So this is how it works. Uh, we have a model. This is the example of GPT-3. It is given a huge amount of texts in which it uh, splits that text into, let's say, words. It's actually tokens. Token can be a part of a word, but let's say that base is the word. And then, according to that sequences, it predicts what would be the next most probable word. Uh, if you are, so this is the pre-training part. When you need a model, when you need a lot of hardware, uh, because those models are huge, GPT-3 has about 175 billion parameters. It needs a huge amount of, of, of uh, graphic uh, processing units and huge amount of texts. And from that uh, pre-training, it learns how to predict next word. Then, if you want to apply it to a specific domain, uh, you can uh, try to use some kinds of fine-tuning the model. That means that, for example, if we know that input is a robot must, GPT from before the training uh, predicts that next word should be ex ex exterminate. Uh, you should plug in some kind of fine tuning or human level reinforcement learning when uh, people would say, okay, uh, this is wrong, you should be use obey. And then in that way, you can fine tune model and partially control how it will uh, generate uh, the next sequence. And uh, can we go back to the uh, two sides? One, one more. Uh, so when you have that, you can apply it to a different uh, types of tasks. For example, you can ask it, okay, please generate me a speech. 
and uh, it will be able to generate text. But you can also ask, uh, give me which type of document would this be, and then give him a couple of options, and then it would classify your text. Or you can give, give it a couple of texts and say how you would uh, uh, clusterize it in different groups. So actually, text generation is not just uh, for the task of text generation. It can be used for all these various tasks. Uh, but uh, for some of these tasks, there are other algorithms which are even better. For example, for the classification, you can use some kind of classification algorithm, which is much different than text generation. Uh, you can use for the uh, search, summarize, uh, extract. You can use uh, some kind of uh, data retrieving models, which are also different from text generation. So uh, in order to be able to cope with these different tasks, you really can't use just one model, for example, GPT, chat, GPT, or boom, or any, any uh, one single model. You can use it. But uh, the best results would be if you know different types of algorithms and you know how to combine them and what are the best ways to use each of them. Uh, one of the ways, for example, for text generation was uh, what we mentioned is to uh, uh, control it via, via fine tuning or human level reinforcement learning. And Anya will later explain the process for that. Uh, the other way is through prompting uh, to write a very <coughs> specific prompt and, and things like that. So, uh, so uh, this is basically how it works. When you give it a text input, uh, like I said, it splits to, into the tokens, but it doesn't work with tokens. Each token is actually a dimensional vector, a vector in n dimensional space. So it converts it to, to numbers, to vectors, and it works like a vector. Uh, when it finds most probable next vector or most similar vector, it will again translate it from the numbers to the, to the tokens, and then that's how it works. It doesn't see words. <coughs> Why uh, this is important information? Because uh, uh, we have to know that uh, those algorithms does, uh, that do not understand really words. They do not understand text. They understand their, some other universum, which is all made of the numbers. They don't see any text, text inside of it. So uh, we have uh, original text. We do some pre-processing, which splits it into tokens. Then this is the space that models see. Just, uh, OK, here are zeros and num uh, ones, but actually it has much more dimensions. And then when you feed that to the model, it gives you results you can use. So actually translating uh, words into the, into the numbers. Yeah, and one thing that I just wanted to mention is that in their universe, uh, whole reasoning is based on just probability distribution. So it's generating text not based on any uh, understanding, actually, but just based on probability distribution, which will generate the next sequence. Okay, this is part uh, which can be really interesting to the uh, organizations which like to, to use artificial intelligence. And that's something, uh, when Deepo started, it's, it was almost 10 years ago. Uh, it was something which is interesting research, but now it seems that it will be uh, um, the situation in which each organization will have to find itself, because uh, it seems that each organization uh, will have to adapt to AI and to try to use it in some way. Uh, what is important when we s talk about AI and we say that those models are huge and really expensive, that's uh, especially true when we are talking about pre-training part. And it costs million, millions of dollars literally to train a model. It costs a bunch of data and it costs a lot of hardware, <coughs> which is expensive. Uh, but when you have pre-trained model, uh, you can use it as it is. For example, plug into some uh, large model and ask it to write a summary, to write a uh, uh, text or a report or speech. But uh, if you are um, 
capable with prompting, it could be quite good, uh, but it won't, won't be good enough uh, because using model as it is uh, doesn't have enough knowledge about your specific domain. So this is the part which is really important, the part in which uh, organization prepares its own data. It has to be uh, uh, involved in the process of every day of organization uh, 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 works. So probably, uh, actually you won't like to you know, take some part of stuff and say, okay, now you have to label data. It should be part of the process of, uh, of their job. So they, uh, by doing their everyday job, they collect new data and then you can fine tune it. You don't need such huge amount, amount of data for fine tuning. It's small amounts are just uh, uh, extremely useful. So after that, you can fine tune the model and then use prompting on that to get better results. So when we are talking about the uh, different organizations, uh, when we, uh, when we had ChatGPT uh, emerged, it was in November, late November, I think, or December. After that, we have a, a huge amount of different applications which provide artificial intelligence services. Uh, these are some of them. What we don't know, and we are not sure, is how many of these applications, but probably a huge percentage of them, uh, is relying on Chat GPT or GPT-3 model. Uh, why is that important? Because when we, you use GPT uh, model, uh, it uh, generates text in a certain way. So if there are some limitations or, or some instructions, what kinds of text it should generate and in what, what way it should generate text, those uh, constraints would also appear in these in these applications. If there are some kinds of technical issues with the GPT, there will be technical issues with the, with the applications that rely on GPT. That's, that's some, I don't know, I wouldn't say problems, but things to think about when trying to use GPT inside some organization or government. Uh, you are sending data and you are receiving feedback from them. So uh, data is not anymore under your control uh, what, how the model would generate the answer is partially in your control, but partially it's not, partially it's inside some constraints. So those are all issues that uh, maybe organization should consider and maybe they should think about using their own, uh, <coughs> their own models and their own technology so they don't share the model, and they don't have to share the model and share the data. So uh, a lot of uh, stuff lately is, uh, is uh, said about GPT-3 and uh, we just wanted to show that when we are talking on the large language models, it's just one of the many models. So it's not the only model of the, on the market. There are, for example, uh, different types of models from different companies. Uh, some of them are, um, here's Bard, Jurassic, uh, Goofers, Chinchilla. There are some models which are smaller, which can be easily adopted on some less expensive uh, hardware. And there are some models which are completely open source. That means that you can uh, download it to your machine and uh, do whatever you like with that. So for example, Galactica is open sourced, um, Llama is open sourced, and uh, Bloom is open sourced, but it is huge. So those are all different models with different uh, capabilities. On some of those models, GPT-3 or Chat GPT or GPT, I'm not sure about GPT-4, but uh, I believe it stands for that also. On some tasks, those are better, but there are also some models which are better on some tasks than GPT and, uh, and Chat GPT. Yeah, and uh, Jan uh, was talking about, on the one hand, how is GPT-3 uh, trained? And on the other hand, uh, that all those models relies on some probability distributions in the end. So there was raised a question, what can we do better to reach better results when it comes to large language models? And there were 
three levels of uh, way of training those models. First one was that uh, unsupervised training where we knew uh, what is uh, the correct answer, which word should be the next one, and if it makes mistakes, we say, okay, that's not good, try again. And then we are trying to refine those probability distributions. But for some tasks, uh, there is really uh, important human interaction, and one of those tasks is uh, summarization. So, uh, when we are thinking about one text and about their summary, what is the correct answer? So, we can consult some expert and tell them, okay, here is the original text, can you write me a summary based on this text? And then when we try to uh, train those models, we can say, okay, let's say how much is AI generated summary different from the one that human proposed, because that is the best one we know so far. But when you think about amount of data that we need to train those models, and that is large amount of data, it is really difficult to find that much people that will write you for every text a summary that you will uh, try to compare to. So it's still not enough. Uh, the new approach that was published along with ChatGPT is actually reinforcement learning with human feedback. So reinforcement learning is just a part of artificial intelligence that has AI agent as its major role, and it's interacting with environment. Environment is giving rewards, so it says whether is it good or bad, and then agent is trying to update its policy and then to make the new action the best one. So the thing that they developed and that is now doing when we are training the large language models is actually okay, AI will generate the summary because we are not having that many humans that will write on their own the correct summary in that way, but then we will have human scoring. We will have a lot of prompts, we will have that reward model, and then we will give to humans to give score to the summary they got. So you probably have seen at ChatGPT when it gives you answer, you can say uh, thumbs up or, or thumbs down, and then it will refine its results in the next time. So that is really important because um, in the large language models, it's really important to try uh, to make better uh, results and better outputs but to consult humans, because when we are writing a summary, it's really difficult to determine uh, just the next word and to say, okay, that word is not enough, but the whole context is really important. So we had the summary that is compared to the human written one, but then a new approach is to try to uh, have help of humans by scoring the summaries that we've got. And again, when it comes to any usage of large language models, it's really important to know how to do it because you probably uh, use ChatGPT in some way, but it's really important how you say that you want something and what you write as your input prompt. So uh, prompting engineering <laughs> became really popular and uh, there are a lot of materials, books, because prompting nowadays, it's really important to use large language models in the right way. Second. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and here was just, uh, there are a lot of uh, ways to prompt some model. You can uh, just try to give some text to say rewrite it and to uh, hope that it will understand what it means. You can even uh, give test description and then some examples. Because with examples uh, and some output indicator for that examples, when you set it uh, as an input to large language model, you can get better results because you explain better what are your expectations of that model. Okay, uh, just uh, uh, when, when uh, we say about prompting, I just wanted to add that <clears throat> uh, when you prompt a large language model, it's actually, I would say it's something like you're asking it to do something. Uh, 
I won't say you instruct it to do something because it doesn't mean that the model will, will, will comply with, your, with, your, uh, with what you are asking. Uh, that's the problem. For example, if you have some text and you want a uh, model to summarize it, you can write it, okay, uh, make me a summary of the model, of the, of the text, and uh, pay attention not to change any fact. But it doesn't mean that it will do that. Uh, the problem with these models is that they're, mm, in some times, they're making things up. They need some kind of, of uh, um, liberty to, to change text in order to generate some, some new text. So uh, when you give it a liberty to change text, uh, it can change facts, and that, that what is, uh, that's what, what's something that you should pay attention when, when you use that kind of models. It can change facts, and, uh, and it will be much harder to detect uh, when it made up something up than, uh, you know, when, uh, than before. Because before, when you have some unskilled uh, human writer who writes text which is not uh, based on the facts, you could probably, as an expert, easily find uh, what are the mistakes. But now, uh, the texts sound really convincing, and it takes more time to, to uh, obtain that, that, that mistakes. So uh, basically, when we are talking about GPT models, uh, we heard that there are usually among people some kind of confusion. What is GPT? What is ChatGPT? What is GPT-3? So basically, uh, we have uh, it like this. We have, uh, for example, IQVAO was started uh, five years ago in 2018, and it was uh, working on GPT-2 back days. So GPT-2 had 14 billion parameters, and when you ask it a question, it would be able, uh, or ask it to write a speech, it would be able to write two pages of a speech from which you could extract just one paragraph of, meaning, on, of meaningful text. The rest of it would be garbage. Uh, after that, we had GPT-3 emerged. GPT-3 was much better. It had 175 billion parameters, and it is able, when you ask it uh, to generate two pages of text, all two pages would be, would be uh, meaningful. Uh, back then, when we used GPT-2, you could easily uh, find out if text was written by AI or by human. If it has a bunch of mistakes, that means that AI has written it. Now, with GPT-3, if you have two texts and you find some mistakes I think I, I talk about grammatic mistakes and uh, mistakes in a fullness of, of, the, of the language. Uh, if it has that kind of mistakes, that definitely means that uh, AI didn't write it, that human write, wrote it. So it's much more advanced in that way than GPT-2. GPT, chat GPT actually is uh, called also GPT-3.5. That's the same GPT-3 model of 175 billion parameters trained or pre-trained on the text GPT-3 was screen trained on, and uh, after that they used human level reinforcement learning Anya mentioned. So uh, they gave it to the public via API, and uh, they also uh, had a bunch of uh, experts working on the labeling text, and then they fine-tuned that model and uh, announced it as GPT, chat GPT, or GPT-3.5. Actually, GPT-3.5 is reinforced, uh, human reinforced level, uh, um, um, earned GPT-3, and uh, chat GPT is GPT-3.5 uh, fine-tuned on the dialogues of humans. So it is more appropriate for, for chatting with it. And finally, GPT-4, that's something that is announced, uh, I think, 10 days ago or something like that. Uh, we can't say a lot of, about that model because they didn't disclose it. Uh, they say that it's much bigger than GPT-3.5 or GPT-3. Uh, they say that it's, that it's much better. We have to, you know, try it and see. But, for example, they disclosed the, the scientific paper about the GPT-4, but in that paper they said that they uh, are not going to disclose anything regarding uh, model architecture or data on which it is pre-trained. So, they are not of the, the data. Uh, thing that we know about GPT-4 or we heard of from them is that it will be able to work both on text and on images. So, for example, you could 
uh, not generating images as they will be diffusion models, but uh, on um, understanding images. So it should work like this. You should be able to send it image and then ask a question about the image or photo and it will be able to, to give you the answer what is going on on the, on the photo or image or video. So it will be able to, un to understand or, or somehow uh, uh, interpret what is going on on the, on the video as well. Uh, the second big change uh, uh, is that uh, GPT-4 can accept 32,000 of tokens while GPT-3 or 3.5 was able to accept only 4,000 4, 4, tokens. That means that you could give it much larger part of the book or, or report or stuff like that and ask to analyze it, which is, which is a huge improvement if it works. And also, uh, it's a great big thing because those models are few short learnings. That means that if you ask it to do something, it can do it decently well. But if you ask it to do something and give it a couple of examples how it can be done, it is much better. Uh, if you have a bigger amount of tokens that you can feed in, then you are able to give it much precise or more detailed examples. So uh, we can expect that it will get better results in that area. I can start. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in the end of this uh, first part, we just wanted to mention uh, the CICER algorithm because uh, all those models, including uh, GPT-4, where they introduced something new, which is that you can have images as input, uh, they're just becoming larger and larger, but they're not that much uh, revolutionary new in those models because they are just generative models that are having text as input, usually text as output, and they're generative models that are uh, generating text. And the one uh, actually uh, really good model that actually done something uh, different that ne no one did it before is Cicero, which is um, algorithm that was trained to play diplomacy game. And uh, the thing that is actually different is that it combined both language model and uh, just reinforcement learning in playing games, where we have like two parallel universes where we have first, here is the action, actual model, where we have dialogues as input and current state as input. And this here is totally dialogue free. So it's just reinforcement learning model that plays a game. And when it determines what is the best action, it actually gives again to large language model to generate uh, and to act in the environment to have message generation, to have again new dialogue and current board state, and then to generate output message. So even though it maybe sounds uh, similar to uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback, in reinforcement learning with human feedback for a large language model, we only had human scoring as an input again for the model. But again, it is just a text-based model. And here we are having a combination of both reinforcement learning for games and a large language model uh, from which we are trying to extract the actions that they are trying to take and then to determine which are the our next uh, action. Uh, Jovan was uh, playing more <laughs> with this algorithm and playing the diplomacy game, so he will uh, talk a bit about his experience from practice. Yes, it's. Um in case you, you didn't uh, you know, play the game, uh, it's actually the strategy game with uh, negotiations. So you have uh, different countries and each country ha can take certain action against other country and uh, uh, before taking the action they can contact other players and say, okay, uh, I'm gonna take this action, would you join me, would you support me or would you, uh, can we agree not to attack me or Anything, any kind of negotiation uh, between the, the moves. So, um, what is the main point of this? The main point is that uh, there are different approaches of, 
of uh, uh, talking about AI. GPT is one of the approaches. It's, it is tech generative model. It was revolutionary at that time, especially when GPT-3 emerged. It was the same technology as GPT-2, but uh, produced much better results. But uh, we shouldn't neglect the other, the other uh, um, areas of research of AI as well. Uh, this kind of model is a, a completely different approach because it doesn't, um, when you use text generator, it can't, there is really no agent which lives in a certain model of world and which tries to, to uh, take a stance for its own you know, beliefs or, or actions. Uh, in this kind of models, artificial intelligence models, you have a model of the world, you have the actor, and then you feed that actor with the, with the rules of the game. And then you give it reward or punishment according to, to its actions. So there is actually an uh, um, actor in the environment which tries to negotiate with others and try to find out what is the best strategy for itself and what is the best strategy for the other players. And only then, when it finds the best strategies, it can uh, use third generation to communicate with them. But completely different approach in which you really have some kind of virtual, I wouldn't say being, but actor, uh, which has the, the game in which it, it moves. So uh, definitely, uh, um, that should point out uh, about, not about the, uh, the model Cicero, but about different approaches that there are in artificial intelligence. Thank you, thank you, Jovan and Anya, for your, the introduction to all these details, AI models, and uh, the comparative approach between the uh, GTB, GPT models, uh, that is very important for non-technical people, I think, uh, to understand, but because we see everywhere GPT, AI, open AI, and the, the, to understand their, uh, differences, it is always a kind of a big research for us ordinary people. <laughs> but uh, thank you for sharing the, your experience in this. And uh, it's, uh, I think, uh, um, a great uh, approach and uh, f the hope for the future that we'll get it more and more uh, developed. Let me thank uh, Anya and uh, Jovan for their great practical presentation and uh, also IQ Walla who did a great job today <laughs> thank you very much thank you